pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you. Seth and Dan invited me to get together with you this evening and share some thoughts and just some observations that related to the travel industry, uh, in particular to the audience here this evening, and specifically to United Airlines, where, as Seth just said, is where I spend my days over in the Willis Tower. In thinking about our conversation this evening, I actually thought back to last Thursday, which would have been uh, a week ago, what is that, today's Tuesday, several days ago, and I was spending time Thursday afternoon in San Francisco with a new friend, a guy named Peter Fram, who is, Peter Pham, is one of the founders and owners of a company by the name of Science, which is one of the main investors in Dollar Shave Club. How many of you have heard of Dollar Shave Club? And very, very successful uh, venture. And Peter and I were talking about the marketing methods, the customer service methods, the customer engagement methods that Dollar Shave Club and other startups, successful startups of its ilk are using. And frankly, the only word I can use to describe the conversation is exhilarating. Just how fast marketing practices are changing, growing, developing, accelerating via social commerce in particular and associated methods. So we were having this very enthusiastic, highly engaged conversation sitting at a place called The Battery out in San Francisco uh, about Dollar Shave Club. And Peter made the comment to me about the market share that Dollar Shave Club is capturing from Gillette and how Dollar Shave Club is, is eating into the business of Gillette. And we talked about it a little bit, and I said, okay, Peter, let me ask you a question. Now, if you were at Gillette, knowing what you do today with the startups you've done, the success you've had in social commerce, tech commerce, so to speak, now you're dropped down at Gillette. What would you do? And he sat back in his chair and he stopped and he said, that's a really interesting question. I never really thought of it. And so what we talked about was, so now, now you're Gillette. What do you do? And the reason I bring up that example from last Thursday is because more and more that's what I find interesting, is looking at the world, in this case the world of commerce, the world of online commerce, the world of marketing, first from the point of view of, in this example, Dollar Shave Club, what can we learn from the marketing practices, the customer engagement, the social media applications, and then mentally flipping over and doing it from the point of view of, in this example, Gillette. What can we adopt? What can we learn? What can we potentially acquire on that side? And these days, I just think that's a really neat exercise to flip back and forth. So now if we apply it to the travel industry, to our conversation here this evening, we ask, who is the Dollar Shave Club of the travel industry? Who is the Gillette, in this example, of the travel industry? Arguably, I work for one of the companies analogous to Gillette in the travel industry. Perhaps in the course of the five sets of individuals we'll hear from this evening, perhaps we'll hear from the future Dollar Shape Club of the travel industry. But my point is, what can we, now I'll do it from my day job, United Airlines, what can we, United Airlines, learn from, adopt from, potentially acquire what you in the audience this evening and your counterparts out there are doing in the travel industry? I think that is a fascinating question because the fact of the matter is that while it is in a world of buzzword cliches, I suggest the term digital transformation and digital marketing transformation specifically has become an overused bordering on cliche term. The fact remains, it still remains true despite the fact that the term is overused, that I suggest virtually every, if not literally, every major established legacy corporation in the travel industry and in any number of other industries that we could name is in the process of going through the digital transformation of their business model and specifically, again, specific to what I do, 
their, their marketing, their distribution, their customer engagement, and so on. And I suggest that process of digital transformation will continue for at least the visible time horizon right now. It is nowhere, nowhere close to, certainly in the travel industry, nowhere close to have running its course. So what I thought I might do is to flip over now and try to provide you with some insights into the world from the point of view of United Airlines as it relates to some of the subjects that we've touched on here while stating within our allotted time because this is all that stands between you and, and five successful, potentially successful startups and the after party. So I wanna be, be mindful of our, our time here. But you know, we have an individual, had an individual in a very influential position associated with United Airlines who would always say, typically when I was talking about marketing or customer engagement, whatever the case may be, and would typically say, well, if this were Zappos, well, if this were Zappos, here's what we would do. And I would always stand there, be in front of the room or whatever, and, and think to myself, well, other than the fact that they are effectively one channel, we are by any definition multi-channel, most of our critical systems are older than their founder, much less older than their company, older than their founder, and perhaps uh, pedestrian but highly relevant, we have 85,000 employees around the world, the majority of whom work with us under organized labor agreements. Other than those three things, we and Zappos are virtually identical. <laughs> and so I, I always thought, you know, that, that isn't really helpful to say, well, if United Airlines were Zappos, well, we're not. And so let's deal with the real world of United Airlines as it exists today. And I thought what might be of interest to you, I always try to think, if I were in the audience, you know, what, what would I be thinking? And at this point, I would be thinking two things. A, I should have brought two cups of coffee into this, not one. And, and B, then I should have sat nearer to the door so I could get out of the men's room and get back and no one would notice. Um, that's, that's what I've been thinking. But I thought maybe it would be interesting to get some insight into the, okay, so we're not Zappos. And what are the consequences of that? And I'll just use two anecdotes to illustrate in tangible terms what is the observation everyone makes. What's the biggest difference? Well, the biggest difference is scale. The biggest difference is scale. I mean, you know, what, 5,000 and some flights a day, 147 million passengers last year, 24 million active users of our mobile app. So biggest difference is scale. But what does that really mean in practical terms? <clears throat> Here's example number one, just a little insight into into if you flip over, take my, my you know, much used Gillette example, if you flip over and tomorrow you're at United Airlines, what does your world look like? Example number one, last summer one day, I don't remember what month it was, it was in summer, the weather was nice out, and at noon, now follow the timeline here, at noon, I walked out the door to, to meet a coworker, another senior executive at, at United, at, for those of you who are from Chicago, the Florentine restaurant in the JW Marriott Hotel on Adams Street. So we met at noon and we're having, and, and when I left the office at noon, life seemed okay. How fast things can change. And so we're, we're having, frankly, one of those conversations over lunch, sort of difficult, talking about some, some difficult issues. My phone went off, I looked, it was my assistant, no message. Well, she'll get old maybe if she needs me. Half hour later maybe, phone rings. It's like, well, this is a pretty important conversation. I'm gonna finish this, finish it. Finish the lunch conversation at two. Walk back in the door of the Willis Tower. Someone grabs me by the arm in the, in the lobby of Willis and says, you need to come to so-and-so's office on the 14th floor right now. Go up to the 14th floor. Here's what had happened. And the relevance, you'll, the relevance of this is particularly timely for this audience because it involves us using technology and a service developed by a third-party provider. There is a third party provider who has a service that we use for certain functionality, I won't get into it here, related to how we deliver fares and inventory to our website. For the purposes of this evening's conversation, it's all the relevant facts that are required. Okay, third party technology, we use it to deliver fares and inventory to our website. Had a problem. By, here's a sequence of events. By 2.30, the site was down. By 
3 o'clock, we had a conference call of legal, government relations, IT, operations, and a set of other functions, including actually one person who's in the room this afternoon, from, uh, or this evening, from CorpCom, because by 3 o'clock, the story had been picked up by the Associated Press. Bear in mind, by 3 o'clock, the story had been picked up by the Associated Press. Once it hit the AP wire, the story was picked up nationwide um, by broadcast, print, media outlets. By 4 o'clock, the Department of Transportation was involved. Okay, 4 o'clock, the DOT is involved. The site was back up, functioning properly. Two and a half hours later, the total outage, and it wasn't even an outage, it was the total error time during which erroneous fares and inventory were being provided lasted less than two and a half hours. The next morning, two things happened. A, people were flying on fraudulent tickets in Asia and Europe. And B, when I was driving to the train station at 7.30 in the morning, turned on the CBS Morning News, and it was on the CBS Morning News. And what it said was, United Airlines has website failure. When I was driving, to the train, it says, United Airlines has website failure. Now, and, and as that played out, we ultimately ended up reporting on it to our audit committee of the board, and, and it played out over a series of time. My point in that example is that if you wonder sometimes in dealing with us why we are, I'll be the first one to say, we don't yet meet any definition of agility. I'm, I mean, any definition of agility. We don't yet meet any definition of agility. Uh, however, if there are times when one may be prone to wonder why is it that everything seems so tedious, so tedious, and if you don't think it is, I'm telling you it is, okay? Um, <laughs> why is that? Because we are very prone to what I think of as the butterfly effect in our internal IT systems. Everyone knows the butterfly effect, you know, if a butterfly, uh, Flap its wings in South America, people would be laid off in Beijing or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but you know, everybody here seriously knows, knows what the butterfly is. We are very prone to what I think of as the butterfly effect with our internal systems. Because there are so many internal systems that are of eras, multiple eras, that have been connected, and in our case, literally the, the, the result of merger combinations. So many different systems tied together that there is an extremely high potential for unintended consequences of IT changes. And again, for those of you who are developers, and my understanding is a lot of developers in the audience, if you want to just sort of do that mental exercise of flipping over into the other side of it, you're dealing in a highly, highly, highly interconnected world where a, this is not hypothetical, where a router going down in a tertiary data center can in fact bring down the ability to board planes on the other side of the country. Okay? And if the example seems hyperbolic, imagine if it were a data breach. I mentioned mileage plus. Imagine if that example were a data breach on the scale of some of them that have been reported in the media. So if, if you wanted just for the sake of mental exercise or just intellectual interest flip over, that is one consequence of scale, is that the, the consequences spiral up like that. And, and within two and a half hours, you're on the national news and, and have fraudulent activity literally around the world, number one. Example number two, with, first I want to do something that I always do. How many people think this is relevant to what you came here to talk about tonight? Yeah? A few. That's better than normal. Um, okay, example number two. Uh, one of the things about dealing with, with a large company is it would seem like the, the IT resources are virtually unlimited. In fact, the comp and I'll, I'll bring this to, for those of you who may want to interact, you know, introduce new, new uh, ventures out there, uh, what I think the prioritization of our interests and investment going forward will be, okay? And, and 
it all starts with the fact that while it may seem that the IT resources are immense, the fact of the matter is the competition, and again, I think nothing I have said so far, other than perhaps a little bit of the visibility in system, uh, you know, in the case of system outages, none of this is unique to United Airlines in any stretch of the imagination, my judgment, including the following. The internal competition for IT resources, that extends far beyond uh, e-commerce, customer engagement, so on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the number of improvements, enhancements and improvements to our app and website, as of last Friday, actually, no the real number, as of last Friday, the Q4 enhancements and improvements to our mobile app and united.com had 362 jobs in it. That is a real number as of last Friday. So my point is, when we evaluate and deal with, I mean, some of the companies represented in this room, actually, and certainly many, many of your counterparts and colleagues out there, and often someone will preface a conversation by saying, wouldn't it be cool if we could do such and such? Don't you think it would be cool if we provided this on your mobile app? Wouldn't it be cool if the United mobile app could fill in some novelty, typically content-related, typically leisure travel-related, often leisure travel-related feature. And the consequence of having 362 items in the queue is that wouldn't it be cool often is an insufficient criterion for the investment. So what is a sufficient criterion? I would say number one, enhancing the customer service, customer engagement, broadly speaking, customer experience with United. I would be hard pressed to think of anything that would rank above that in terms of our, and I'm talking within the specific division for which I'm responsible, our prioritization. So, jumping back to my conversation with Peter Pham last Thursday, he said, there is no reason why I should not be able to have a customer service interaction with United Airlines via Facebook Messenger. You're absolutely right. Can't do it today, you're absolutely right. Okay, that type of interaction, very high on the priority list. Is that gonna get to the top of the queue? You bet. It, more broadly, creating social media enabled ways to deal with the travel experience and travel disruptions an arcane travel term that is extremely important, irregular operations. What does irregular operations mean? Yesterday there was a hailstorm at O'Hare. Flights get canceled. The first week in January of this year, there was an enormous snowstorm at O'Hare. We were, as I recall, grounded for two days, I think. That is, in the airline world, irregular operations. That's what I mean. Now, how do we and these are not hypothetical, these are not hypothetical questions. I mean, these are very real questions. How do we adopt from the dollar shave clubs of the world the methods to better deal with those experiences like the disruption in the first part of this year? Very high priority. Second down on the list, revenue generation. I mentioned the exhilarating advances in marketing methods, uh, revenue generation definitely second on the list. Pretty low on the list, frankly, for necessary reasons are developments that largely meet the criterion of wouldn't it be cool. And there are often times when in talking with, and again, sometimes people in this room, and you can sort of see the look in someone's eye of, you know, why don't you get it? Like, just why don't you get it how cool this would be? And there are, there are times when I'm, I'm kind of say like, you know, as I said, not quite as dumb as I look, almost, but not quite as dumb as I look. It's simply a matter of resource allocation and customer engagement's gonna come first over what would simply be, uh, wouldn't it be cool to be able to provide this? So that is a semi-quick, semi-brief tour of the waterfront, uh, but, but I think as, as, you know, people always talk about what is the future of travel, and I know when, when Seth and Dan asked me to, to chat this evening is what is the future of travel? And people I think think 787, and that is the future of travel, you know, 787, biofuel, so on and so forth. But for the purposes of our conversation this evening, the future of travel is 
social media enabled, social media connected, other intermediated, customer engagement, customer service, customer interaction with the airline. That is by far and away the most important priority. <laughs> and so, so I will just leave you with that thought. Uh, hopefully somewhere in there there was something relevant to what you're here to talk about. And if not, the good news is it's done. And, um, <laughs> and shift over to uh, if Seth wants to chat any further.